PhotoShelter is the leader in online portfolio websites and tools for professional photographers. We help you get business, do business, and keep business. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi speaking to you from PhotoShelter World Headquarters here in New York City. Uh, we have a very, very interesting uh, webinar today about an emerging part of photography that's come out uh, uh, you know, it's been around for a couple of years, but but it's really kind of exploded and the price has come down enough that it's getting really interesting for even uh, hobbyists to play around with. Before I make the introduction uh, to our guest uh, panelist today, I want to do some housekeeping notes. To the right of your computer, you should see a go-to webinar control panel. And from that panel, you can ask us questions as we go along. We'll do our best to sort of incorporate the questions into the conversation. And we have the lovely Sarah Jacobs also from our office answering and monitoring questions as we go along. Uh, and we're also going to be on Twitter today. So if you follow us at PhotoShelter and you can also hashtag any comments or questions that you have with hashtag Aerial Photo. And that's the singular for whatever reason. But with that, let me introduce you to my uh, often referred to as my West Coast doppelganger, uh, Eric <laughs> Chang. Eric, how are you doing? Very good. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Eric, we've we've known each other for a little while. Uh, you you've you've been sort of the underwater guy running uh, the website What What Pixel uh, for many many years, and now it seems like you're emerging from the water and taking to the air. Why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of your 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 forays into photography? Yeah, so I am um, actually going underwater for me uh, was the reason I became a photographer because I you know it was the inspiration that I needed to to become interested in taking pictures and sharing them with people and really you know discovering these interesting stories uh, that happen underwater which are so unusual uh, amazing that you know nature has given us these bizarre creatures that we never see except to eat and um, and so uh, for I don't know about 10 years I was really in the field most of the time uh, under underwater taking pictures and and over time I just you know I was in these amazing places that are not photographed very often, um, except underwater, um, and often there would be this another perspective that I that I wanted to get. So I'd climb up the masts of these big Indonesian yachts, you know, these schooners, and um, you know, you climb a hundred feet up and dangle off this thing and take some pictures. And of course, you're attached to the boat, so there's only so much you can do from there. Um, and so I always wanted to put a camera up above these environments uh, to get that that aerial perspective and. You know, I did go up in helicopters a couple a couple times to try to get those pictures, and um, there's very expensive, um, not as easy as it looks. And, um, and of course, if you don't get the shot in the hour or two, you have the helicopter, you're not going to get the shot. So, anyway, I've been looking at these hobbyist multi-rotor, you know, quadcopters, hexacopters. Um, oh, we have some pictures here. Um, so, I, marine mammals. I love whales and dolphins and and photographing them in the wild, and this this guy on the left just, uh, you know, I just I, lo I looked up from on, on a shark dive, and he was just there. So <laughs> a little unexpected to have a an animal there, and then sperm whales to the right, and um, you know, finding these whales in the in the wild can be difficult, and we rely on local expertise and hydrophones and things, and you know, if we could do some aerial survey stuff um, to find them, that would help as well. I haven't done any of that, but. Um, so you were a, a, a computer it. science major, both for your your bachelor's and your master's. You, you, it seems like you have a fairly technical approach to all of your photography. Yeah, I have a technical approach in the beginning to all of my photography because most of the photographic pursuits that I'm involved in are are highly technical. Um, underwater photography is is a good example. There's a lot of gear involved. You know, you you have we shoot with normal cameras. And we house them in waterproof enclosures, but optics work differently, and lighting is challenging because water strips away light from red, you know, all the way down the spectrum. So you get these kind of blue-green pictures, and so most people who get into underwater photography never, they never graduate past technical mastery. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like you know you get the technical stuff out of the way, just do it, understand it, get everything under your fingertips, uh, and then really that's where photography begins. And so. I mean, it's great because it's challenging, which means that not as many people are doing it. So the pictures are perhaps a little more unusual than, you know, than what your friends are doing, which is always good for photographers. But, um, you know, but it all, it's also a shame that it prevents people from doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, doing, having a software background, I think, 
helps in pretty much every industry now. It's just if you are empowered to do things like write code for a website, you know, you can get something online and share it with people much, much easier. Um, the 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 costs for underwater photography, we really haven't seen sort of a, a dramatic decline in the way that we have with with the drone aerial photography. So I guess it's still and, and obviously the, the technical challenge of breathing underwater introduces a, a variable that might keep a lot of people out of that that realm. Yeah, the you know the dive gear, survival gear stuff, that's all pretty much been the same. I mean it's very reliable now, that's one big difference. Um, and the underwater photography gear is, it's, it's really, it's not that we c couldn't make it cheaper, it's that there aren't enough people doing it to make it cheaper. Mm. So, you know, the housings we use are from relatively small companies, they don't make very many of them. They're machined out of aluminum. You know, they're very expensive and um, they can't get the cost down through economies of scale. So, I think it will be, it'll, in the high end of underwater photography, it will always be expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. But of course you have you know, GoPros and lots of waterproof models from all sorts of different manufacturers now making it very easy to snorkel with a camera. So, you know, every year the depth rating goes down. Now it's maybe 10 meters or something. So you could take a camera that looks like a normal point and shoot, but happens to be waterproof, which is still very bizarre to me. And it's <laughs> especially scary to put it in salt water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, you can go for a little 30 foot dive and, and take that camera down. So before we move straight into the uh, aerial photography, why don't you tell us a little bit about WetPixel and, and that community there? Yeah, WetPixel is a community that grew out of uh, a bunch of, of people who had no local community. You know, in the beginning, we were doing digital underwater photography. And that, you know, we always had to say digital underwater photography because there's this big, uh, you know, analog underwater photography movement. You know, everyone was shooting film. Um, so we were just had this community site where we posted news and could chat at a forum up uh, in about 2001 and just grew into uh, a really great community and resource for anyone interested in underwater photography. Um, and so, you know, we hang out in the forums, we post breaking news, and we post um, portfolios of people doing beautiful work. Um, so it's a, it's a good resource, and um, if you're interested in underwater photography, it's a, it's a great place to go hang out. Um, and now the topic of today's <laughs> talk, the drones, otherwise known as unmanned aircraft systems or UAs or UASs. Um, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on, on the legality of it. Uh, obviously, I think drones are, it's kind of a loaded term because of all of the stuff we're doing in Afghanistan <laughs> with them and other places in the Middle East. But um, from from the best of what what I've seen so far, there there really isn't any licensing need from the Federal Aviation Administration standpoint if you are doing drone photography for non commercial purposes, right? Right. I mean, that's the way we understand it. Um, everybody who flies one of these things has their own take on on how you know how legal what they're doing is, and that. You know, that's part of the problem right there. There basically we have very little information other that other than the FAA saying if you're doing this for hobby, non commercial use, it's legal as long as you, you know, follow these these guidelines. Um, and the guidelines are not necessarily laws. And so some people say, well they are laws. Um, and there are of course plenty of people breaking these these or you know not not paying attention to these guidelines. Um, but the guidelines are also sort of fuzzy. It's like don't fly around people you know <laughs> yeah yeah uh, okay well what does that mean that it probably means don't fly in a stadium above a, a giant crowd but you know what about a, a street that has three people on it can you fly down that street if there are no cars maybe I, I don't know I think people everyone has their own take and people fight a lot in the forums about this stuff right so your your take is really that you're approaching it from a hobbyist standpoint um, is, is that how, how you sort of justify it to to the pundits out there yeah, absolutely, and, and no one's accused me of doing any of this like commercially. Um, I think, you know, even categorizing activity as being commercial is a little bit fuzzy because if I come on and talk about my aerial photography work, and I happen to be a photographer, um, does that mean I'm promoting myself? And you know, therefore, uh, it, you know, does it qualify as being commercial use? And so I'm not. I'm not sure. I, one thing I do is I definitely don't take money for what I'm doing with these and um, and I just pursue projects that I think are interesting personally you know so I won't shoot 
real estate or something. Right. Um, and in the meantime, we're all just sort of waiting for um, some certification or you know whatever it is that the FAA has been mandated to do by 2015. Um, we're all just waiting for that, and I'd be happy to go get certified, but there's no way to do it. Yeah, well, I, I'm still waiting for them to uh, get rid of the rule in regards of turning off my cell phone when I'm taking off in an airplane. So hopefully we'll get that <laughs> drone right. ruling as well. But so so basically, I mean, here, here here's the URL there for the FAA. But basically, you have to be under 400 feet. You don't want to be flying around sensitive areas like military installations. Obviously, you don't want to be putting people in danger, et cetera. And you can't do it for a commercial purpose. I'm sure there's a lot of nuance in there, but that's kind of the general gist that that most of the hobbyists are approaching. Right, right. And the more you're in the model aircraft industry, the more you tend to follow these rules because you've been doing it your whole life. This new, these new inexpensive quadcopters are uh, don't require you to sign anything when you buy them. They don't require any sort of you know you don't have to join a club to do it. You just could have get one, and then you walk out into your backyard and you launch this thing and fly around. So. You know, it's a lot of it's education and trying to encourage people not to do the things that could potentially be very dangerous. Of course, you're always on the other side of that, you know, for, for someone else because there's someone else who's definitely more safety conscious than you are mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. And we know while well, well, you're looking at this guy saying, oh, you shouldn't do that, someone's looking at you saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it was the Gizmodo website, I was looking at it as I, I normally do uh, uh, every day. And there was some headline where, you know, amazing, epic video of surfers. <laughs> um, and I watched it. And I guess I was slightly surprised, but not that surprised that you were the guy behind this video. We do have a bit.ly link there for those of you that want to check it out. Um, tell us tell us kind of the, the, the entrance into the aerial photography. What, what sort of considerations did you have when you decided to go into something kind of new? It, I think um, it took me actually a few years to get into it because um, it was actually, frankly, it was very intimidating. You know, I started looking at these things um, in the mid middle to end of, maybe it was like 2007, 2008, I found these videos of hexacopters carrying cameras and I thought, you know, this is obviously going to be huge and uh, how can I get one, you know, and at the time, it was not easy. It was even though I was technical, you had to follow. You had to order all this equipment from Germany and then follow some German wiki and try to compile it and you know stick this thing on a chip and hope your flight controller worked. And, and it was funny. I was looking at um, uh, you know a new friend and acquaintance in this industry's early videos, and he's got a crash compilation video. <laughs> and you know he's crashed so many times. He has a video dedicated to crashing, and that's how it was in the beginning. And and so it took me, I just watched the industry for a long time and what I did was I bought little toys, you know, those little coax helicopters that sell now for like 30 or 40 bucks, but then were, you know, I don't know, hundred dollars. And I flew around my living room, I was mocked by my wife. And <laughs> um, but I think what's great about this, you know, flying these things is that they, they fly exactly the same way the bigger ones fly. So if you can master one of these $30 toys and make the thing whip around your living room without hitting anything, yeah. you can pretty much fly one of these big things. So I spent really like two years flying the little little things on breaks, you know, I'd take a break from work and go fly a battery's worth, which is like five to ten minutes. I started building so, slightly larger ones that could hold helicopter, hold uh, cameras. Mm -hmm. But these, you know, I wasn't in this multi-rotor industry. So really it was, the, you know, it was the phantom. Everyone, everyone who looks into this eventually finds the DJI Phantom, which is sold off the shelf for like five hundred bucks now, yeah. and um, and that price and has it, really come down because when we spoke in the summer, it was like six fifty, and now it's like four seventy five. Yeah, they dropped the price uh, two hundred dollars, really in preparation for the next one coming out, um, which should be in a month or so, and um, and so they're actually fairly cheap, you know, for well for what they are, yeah, four hundred eighty dollars GPS lock. And any you can just throttle the thing up, and it will just hang in the air in front of you. Um, and so, I don't know I I bought that because I didn't really want to be part of the the hobby. And I mean, I am part of the hobby now. I, I build these things on the side, um, but the reason I build them is to educate myself uh, in case I have to fix it. You know, and then I don't have to take it into a distributor, and and which is you know very convenient as well. No, but I can op open it up and you know 
try to debug it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's how I got into it. It took it really took about three years, um, maybe three and a half years, and um, the last uh, I mean since January, so the last nine months or so of of constant practice uh, with these things. So this is a still from that video that we were talking about that you made of surfers in Santa Cruz. Um, it looked like you were contending with some wind. Uh, how how high were you getting the the copter up for this? And what were sort of the environmental challenges of of being outdoors rather than just kind of running it in, in your living room with your wife? Yeah, the wind is always a challenge. Um, not so much because these the aircrafts aircraft can't. Uh, fight that, if the wind because most of these little ones can. I mean, you can fly these things in 15 knot winds without any problem. Um, but what happens is the, the footage becomes pretty unstable uh, because the quadcopter is trying to you know, stabilize itself the mm -hmm. whole time. Um, and the other thing is if you're not uh, comfortable flying, then wind can be problematic if GPS doesn't work for some reason. And then you have to fly it, basically fly it against the wind all the time. And if you're not comfortable that's when you that's when you lose your uh, <laughs> lose your investment right um, so m mostly it was wind that was the issue and um, and of course shooting very very wide you know we're shooting fisheye lenses on these GoPro cameras um, and so you asked how high it was well you know the new ones come with telemetry so that shows you how high you are but until now everyone's basically been flying blind trying to stay under that 400 foot ceiling mm -hmm. um, 400 feet up with a fisheye lens looks like you're, I mean, people say, wow, you can see the curvature of the Earth. Well, you, you really can't. It's like, uh, you know, it's just lens distortion. Right, right. But, um, but it looks like it's really high. And um, so you can get really interesting perspectives even going up only 400 feet. Um, and so, yeah, this was just, it was really an experiment. This, you know, surfers seem like the perfect subject because you don't get to see them uh, from this point of view very often. You know, you, you see them at tournaments, but... You don't get to see the local surfers just surfing, you know, when there's a little bit of a swell coming up. And um, and I thought it was, I don't know, I thought it was it was fascinating. It was from a learning perspective to try to shoot moving objects, kind of looking at a monitor, you know, because we're flying line of sight, but you can compose by looking at a, a monitor, which shows what the camera is seeing. Uh, you know, I wonder. Um, uh you know, when you're underwater, you, you've shot primarily stills underwater. And I know that you've ventured into some video um, in the past few years. But it seems like all of the video work you're doing is kind of primarily focused around, uh, I'm sorry, aerial work is, is primarily focused around video. And I'm wondering if you think there's something about this bird's eye view, you know, speaking completely from a creative point of view, that, that makes it more suitable for video rather than just a still. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I've, I've, I like both, and I think the um, the challenge now is that very few systems allow you to shoot both at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I make a decision, and I, I often will do two flights just so I can get I can get stills because I know I'm going to write. I don't know. I'll write a magazine article, and they'll ask for stills. Um, and of course, stills can be beautiful in a different, very different way. Um, but video is something that that people immediately relate to, and um, and you know, with surfers, for example, the the movement of the waves breaking, and you know, the surfers kind of in that environment is is really interesting. And, and I think camera movements, you know, the, these uh, quadcopters and multi rotors allow you to move the camera sort of like they're on, you know, like a like a crane, or you know, they're it's it's hard to do uh, a vertical dolly movement right. unless you have something very advanced, and, and with with this thing, I can just sort of throttle up and it goes up. Um, so one of the um, videos that I like to show uh, before people know what this is, is a video of a friend of mine, Julian. He's walking on the beach. I don't know if you've seen this, but just walking on the beach and you see him sort of look at the camera and then he does this like very dramatic, you know, air blast move, like fireball move from, you know, Street Fighter. Right. And, and the camera just shoots shoots out like 500 feet <laughs> instantly and sped up. <laughs> Um, and that's to that can be totally unexpected if you don't know that you're looking at someone shooting from an aircraft. Right, right. So the, the, the camera that you're using for both video and stills on the DJI Phantom is the GoPro 3? It's the Go GoPro Hero 3 Black. Hero 3 Black. Yeah. And uh, in, in terms of, of 
uh, you know, the surf video, how much, how many hours of footage or minutes of footage did you have to compile to get to that final product, which was maybe two or three minutes long? Uh, it was all done within um, a, a two-hour visit to uh, to Steamer Lane, and um, you know I'm fairly conservative over water with these things, and so I'll, I'll typically fly five to six minutes per battery, and I have seven batteries. You know, so we're talking wow. say 40 minutes of of footage, um, and some of that footage is me exploring in the beginning as well, since I had never flown in that place, so I didn't know what it looked like from the air, so I had to fly around to see what it looked like. Um, and, um, you know, and it's edited down. I mean, I actually meant, I just did it as a quick edit for, for fun really, but it, uh, hit Gizmodo and ABC and a whole bunch of other places pretty quickly. So (laughs) I think if I could have gone back, I might've paid more attention to the editing. (laughs) (laughs) So here is kind of the, the, the list of items that you were using on that, that, uh, that shoot there. So the DJI Phantom quadcopter. Um, and we saw a little uh, photo of you earlier kind of hovering over your head there. So that's that's about $479. The GoPro Hero uh, is $329. And will you explain what a gimbal is for the audience? Yeah, a gimbal uh, is basically something that allows something else to rotate around an axis. In this context, it's, it's something that lets you stabilize the camera, uh, keep the horizon level. So, you know, you, you, you mount a camera on the gimbal, there's a sensor that that tells the gimbal controller to keep me level. Basically says stay level and so as the quadcopter moves around or anything you can hold it as well the motors, brushless motors, automatically compensate. So you know practically speaking when you put one of these things in the air even if there's a wind it it sort of feels like you you have a steady cam that's floating around. Mm. It's super rock solid and you know there are certain things that can't overcome but if you're shooting video in the air and you're not trying to do one of these like fly through dramatic things pretty much you need a gimbal um, and the price ranges from around 150 to I don't know thousands of dollars I mean for a GoPro maybe the high end would be seven or eight hundred dollars mm-hmm. um, and they're, they're like magic and they've only been around uh, in you know in the inexpensive world since April or so so that it's a very new thing uh, they've been in the high end for for some time yeah, and, and we've seen kind of over the years non-gimbaled aerial shots that just look horrendous because there's so much vibration and, and the horizon's moving all around as you uh, move the copter. Right, right. And that's, that's a big problem. When you're shooting stills, it's not as much of an issue because you can take a, take a lot and then you can, of course, straighten the horizon and, um, and just shoot a lot. Uh, but for video, every movement matters. Um, the monitoring of the video and I guess uh, let me ask the first question is do you have any controls over the gimbal itself or is it just studying itself in this case for $150 you the the gimbal controllers all have inputs pretty much for roll and pitch so you can uh, move the camera view up and down and then and you can roll it from side to side practically we don't use roll because I want the horizon to be level um, but I can control the pitch of the gimbal um, we it was something that uh, involved soldering, <laughs> mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Um, but increasingly is being built into some of the you know the mainstream quadcopters that are coming out. So I think it will not require soldering very soon, and um, everyone will everyone will be able to control it. Uh, and then you need an analog video transmitter, which in the in the RC hobby are very common and inexpensive. Uh huh. Uh-huh. So you, you know you just you can buy one of these things and. Uh, get a special cable, you can make it yourself or buy one from a GoPro um, and just plugs the video signal into the transmitter uh, and then on the other, send, other end you have a receiver and any monitor um, or goggles so you can you know you can have your your uh, field of view completely covered by goggles that are plugged in and uh-huh. just fly it like you're looking out of the front of the thing or you can fly it from uh, an LCD in front of you. Wow that's crazy. Um, do you, do, so in, in this case you are controlling the copter and looking at the video simultaneously and kind of going back and forth and guessing kind of what kind of shot you're getting? Yeah, that's right. So I, I will look at the quadcopter because I, I like to have line of sight. Um, but if I lose orientation, you know, if I momentarily lose it, because they are pretty small, and if you fly it, uh, I don't know, if you fly 400 feet away, it looks you can lose it if you look away even for a moment. Um, so it's really great to have that first-person view uh, so that I can... I can or reorient and um, 
and fly back. Um, it FPV, this first person view stuff, is its own hobby. I mean, people right. you know, put them on aircraft and fly them very far and, and they do it, it's really for fun. Or, you know, more like sport flying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so you'll see people with, they're like sitting in a chair with uh, goggles on, kind of just flying like they're flying in a game. <laughs> right, right. You, yeah. uh, you have you lost any gear while you're doing this? Like how, how, what's the failure rate on this stuff? Well, I've crashed a lot of these things, especially when I was starting early, you know, I crashed around my house, you know, I've put the Phantom up and crashed into trees and, um, and so, but they, they're actually quite sturdy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, especially if you, if you know how they're built, they're very sturdy because it's very hard to destroy one of these things. You can always, almost always recover or change a propeller out. Um, I had one catastrophic failure in Mexico. Um, I was flying over, um, you know, the, the point of this island, which is really beautiful. And, um, there's a lot of wind and, but the thing seemed fine. Um, uh, but it just, it just dropped out of the sky. And, you know, if you go on YouTube and do a search, you'll find some videos where this happens occasionally. You know, these are very comp complicated device. You know, they, they have motors, they have electronics running them and, um, and they're assembled at a factory where people are soldering power connections. And, and so I have no idea what happened, but the thing I lost an entire rig. So, you know, phantom gimbal camera yeah. SD card, yeah. uh, into the ocean and it was unrecoverable. So that was very sad, <laughs> but amazingly, um, insurance covered it. I have travel insurance um, for, for my equipment and, um, and after a long time, you know, probably it might have been their first claim like this. <laughs> uh, I got some money back, of course, with the, you know, minus the deductible. Right, right. Oh, that's so funny. We have some technical questions in regards to uh, what settings you're using on the GoPro. Are, are, are you shooting 1080 um, wide and, and, and are you looking at, at higher resolution stuff like 4K or 2K at all? I shoot, um, I tend to shoot either 1080 or 2.7K, and um, it depends on a couple factors. Uh, one is the GoPro is, you know, it's really wide at full wide, and so I don't always want to shoot full fisheye. So I'll shoot medium, which is only available as, at 1080. Um, so if I really want to shoot medium, I'll shoot 1080. Um, and I'll, I'll typically shoot the highest frame rate I can at that resolution because when you slow down aerial footage a little bit, it, it looks smoother and you know if waves are crashing slower it's more dramatic um, you can shoot at 60p and then and slow it down by 50 percent for mm -hmm. web display or, or more you know slow it down to 24 and it looks really good um, so those are I usually shoot 2.7k wide at 30 or 1080p at 60 um, if it's lower light I'll tend to shoot 1080 at 30 you know a little bit uh, a little slower frame rate I also put polarizers on uh, on my GoPro over water because you know I like I like to cut that reflection out. Yeah. Um, and um, going forward, I'm, I would love to build a larger. Uh, I'm looking at Y6 uh, multi rotors, which have th three arms and six propellers, so two props on each one. Um, and I want to put something uh, higher quality in the air. So I'm. I have a Blackmagic Design Pocket Cinema camera, and that's the next camera that I'm going to put up. Um, and that's really in the hobby world. So I'm looking at frames. Um, I'm looking at. Um, you know, there are a bunch of there are frames from all sorts of companies. One of them is 3D Robotics here in Berkeley, Berkeley and San Diego. They have a, a nice folding Y6 frame um, and their own flight controller and autopilot. Um, so I think my you know the hobby for me will be changing a little bit. Portability is a huge factor in all of my decision making. You know I don't want to show up with a giant octocopter that with a, a 5D on it because you know I'm not shooting. Uh, first of all, I'm not sh shooting commercially. So it's not like I'm shooting for a film. Right. It's mostly hobby right now. Um, and also, I, I want to be able to travel with it. You know, if I, if I leave the country and go somewhere else, the FAA doesn't have rules there. You know, I have to check with the local rules, of course, but um, I can use that footage commercially. So, you know, if I have footage of whale sharks from the air, from the middle of the ocean, I'm going to sell it. What kind of uh, software are you using for post-production? Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, in regards to kind of getting rid of the jelly effect. Um, and other movements that the camera might be introducing. Right. So the Jello is um, it comes from CMOS rolling shutter artifacts, and um, you see it basically in any compact camera. If you just if you move it sideways, you get 
vertical line smear. And um, you get it a lot with these with quadcopters and multi rotors because you have high frequency vibration coming in from from the motors and the propellers. So if your propellers are not balanced, meaning that one side is heavier than the other, as it spins, it's going to introduce vibration into the frame. So the goal basically is to get rid of that vibration. And um, so what people do is they balance the propellers. You get something that you know you can just buy it. It's called a prop balancer, and uh, and you, you use tape or sandpaper uh, to either add weight or remove weight from one side of the prop. So that solves a lot of the vibration issue. And then all of these camera mounts typically have some kind of vibration isolator. You know, so these either silicone balls or mm -hmm. um, I like I like wire isolation a lot. Um, I didn't even know it existed, but if you're really into mechanical vibration isolation, <laughs> which some of the audience might be, right. um, go do a search for wire isolator and you know a whole new world will open up. Um, so you do need to to try to get that high frequency vibration out. For big movements, the really, really the gimbal takes out all you know takes out the all the movements of the quadcopter as it's trying to fight to stay stable against wind and and uh, and your control movements. Mm -hmm. And uh, what what sort of what sort of polarizer are you using on that uh, that that rig that you have? Um, I've tried a couple polarizers. Um, one thing that's tricky about gimbals is that they are designed uh, to be used with perfectly balanced payload. So. You know, for example, the GoPro has an off-center lens, and uh, so if I stick a polarizer on it, it's going to throw these, the, the gimbal balance off. If you have your own gimbal with, you know, with that's totally adjustable, you can account for this. But for example, DJI's gimbal locks the GoPro in place. It's meant to be used with a naked GoPro. Um, so I'm using gimbals that are as light as possible, and um, I mean polarizers. Mm -hmm. um, I use one. Uh, it's called a layer. It's called the layer lens, and it's used to pr protect the GoPro lens. And then somebody made a replacement uh, polarizer for it. So you take the lens off and you put you put the polarizer lens on, and uh. that works very well for me. Um, there are all sorts of adapters that people sell, of course, so that you can you can screw a a threaded circular polarizer on the front of your GoPro. If you have a powerful gimbal, I think you get you could get away with that. Um, I wrote this up on skypixel.org, which is um, a website that I that I run. It's it's my blog basically for aerial work, mm -hmm. and um, and so anything I do that requires uh, <laughs> research, I'll, I'll write I'll write about because it took research, and I'd rather help people to yeah. uh, to become successful in, in this field. Um, so skypixel.org uh, is that URL for you for those of you that want a little more technical detail on how he threw his kid together. We thought that we would show you some uh, options for kind of medium price kits and high price kits. Obviously, the GoPro is a very very small lightweight camera. Oh, and I actually wanted to ask you: are, when you're shooting at at 60 frames per second, are you able to get video stills out of that, or do you go up and specifically shoot stills? Uh, I'll I'll typically go out and shoot stills, although I've I have extracted stills um, and they've been fine. I mean, especially for you know five inch magazine use or something or right. web use, um, stills pulled from video tend to be okay when they're viewed small, um, but they're not good enough for me. So I I tend to just do another flight and try to capture stills. Mm. We had a bunch of questions about people saying, "Can that DJI Phantom carry a DSLR?" And the the answer is no. It's a it's a very small unit. So this is. Uh, something. This is the type of setup that you would need to to fly a DSLR, um, and you'll notice that the price goes up pretty significantly. I, I know some of you are actually adding up these figures, and I want to let you know that the total <laughs> is approximate ballpark, <laughs> just so I don't have uh, uh, you know lots of different numbers. But uh, we 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 jumped up from about twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars, now all the way up to like forty, fifty thousand dollars to get the weight of a, a DSL D, DSLR like a Canon five D. Um, and this obviously so, is like mm -hmm. it's got a lot more, lot more stuff on it. Yeah, and just as a side note to the SLR kit, um, if you are, I mean, you you can buy a ready, a you know, like a cinema rig, they're calling them, ready to go from one of these companies, and and pay this much money. Um, if you're technical, you know, if you can solder and follow instructions and not be afraid, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is which are really the biggest issues. You can build a rig that will hold that will carry an SLR for for under two thousand dollars, and um, uh, so it doesn't have to be this expensive. Um, uh, but of course, you, you're trusting yourself to um, 
to build something that holds a camera that that is worth more than that. Right. Um, right. So I think you know there, even in in this middle range here, it it starts very low and goes very high, um, and you get sort of polish and um, support for the, the the more expensive ones. Um, and of course, there's this whole class of camera. Of course, like the most popular, um, you know, fairly good quality camera in the air right now is the Sony NEX7. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. People are using it because it's it's smaller and lighter. The optics are smaller and lighter. You don't have this optical. You don't have a mirror and an optical viewfinder path, which you just don't need in the air. Um, and uh, and so there, you know, there's this like gradient between what we showed in the last slide and this slide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I assume for a rig like this, uh, you're you might need a a camera operator and a a drone operator as well. I mean, it, it is it's not only a, a matter of equipment. At some point, it's got it's got to be a matter of of bodies on the ground controlling all of this stuff. Right. Um, with these bigger cameras, people tend to use three axis gimbals. So, in, in addition to pitch and roll, they support yaw, which means you can turn the camera. From you can rot rotate the camera sideways, uh, even when the aircraft is not moving. Mm -hmm. So typically the the legs will retract, and you have a full view underneath the aircraft. And that usually requires a second operator, a cinematographer to be filming uh, and a pilot to be flying. Um, I, I think there's a an opportunity for um, well for two things. Uh, one is a, a different interface. You know, we all, we use these two stick radios, which come from the hobby world. That's very short-sighted. You know, there, there's another interface that will enable a single pilot and cinematographer to, to do, you know, with a lot of practice, to do very, very complex movements, and we haven't seen it yet. Um, and also for autonomy. I mean, you you can imagine recording a flight and then playing it back. You know, these things know where they are, and uh, there, a lot of the open source um, flight controllers, like the one from 3D Robotics, it just lets you draw a a path over Google Google right, Maps, right? And so you know you you should be able to script um, the aircraft movement, and then you know then you can take over as a cinematographer during the next pass and or or the next ten passes, and perhaps get you know try to perfect that that movement. And that the the flight path uh, control and software that is that available on on the lower price units like a like a Phantom, or is that something that you really have to move up to the next tier to, to have access to? It's available. Uh, in, in all tiers, and um, and I, I think I mean it's really interesting. That if you ask this question in three months, it'll be very different because everybody is is doing it. You know, the open source community uh, is writing software against it, so you can download these these um, like an Android app for free that will control your your quadcopter if you have mm -hmm. the right uh, flight controller, and you can draw flight paths and you know um, missions. You know, they call them missions with waypoints. And um, on in a commercial company like like DJI, um, they're, they've had it in the high end and they're trickling it down sort of into the low end as they see open source kind of doing it for free. Right. So I think, you know, we're going to see, it's going to be part of what these things do. You know, this is very early. The fact that, that they don't stop themselves before they crash into something is crazy. And I think it's, it's, it should be very simple to put in some more sensors, um, you know, either, either analysis of the video from the, the aircraft or, you know, I don't know, ultrasonic sensors, and we've seen various forms of these in toys and, and other products for a long time, but nobody's integrated it into one that like just won't let you crash it into something. <laughs> yeah, uh, you mentioned um, three different cameras. So uh, the first uh, being the GoPro that you used. Uh, you mentioned the NEX. A lot of people are using that. And then you mentioned that you uh, picked up a Blackmagic camera, um, which is mm -hmm. uh, which is a HD camera that that also shoots RAW. So I'm wondering if it's your intent to kind of play with that raw and shoot higher frame rates as well since you since you can yeah I, I mean my my goal is to shoot as high quality as I can uh, from the smallest possible setup you know so I, I want to fold this thing up and, and carry it on an airplane um, and then unpack it at des at the destination and put it in the air so um, I, I actually I'm not interested in carrying SLRs you know I'm, I'm gonna put some kind of micro four thirds camera up for um, for stills uh, because I think the quality is is good enough. It's, mm -hmm. It actually is quite good, um, and the lenses are tiny. Uh, and then Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, of course, takes Micro Four Thirds mount lenses as well, so I can shoot video with that. Yeah. And um, it's really just the next step. And I think, you know, that while I've been pretty happy with the stills I've been getting from 
the GoPro, uh, you know, I, I would love to be able to do both. I mean, it'd be, you know, the GoPro is, is great on a Phantom because it's relatively inexpensive as an entire rig, and so you can use it in situations in which there's more risk to the, the aircraft, you know, for you losing the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's very easy to carry around. Um, but I'm sure there will be situations in which I want a better camera in the air. We have a, a link at the bottom of this slide, uh, bit.ly slash freefly movi is the way that you pronounce that. So movi is a manufacturer that's making a, a gimbal system. Um, their initial systems were a uh, replacement for uh, Steadicam, uh, which has kind of dominated the technology since, since the 70s. Um, but if you get a chance, check this movie out as well. So it's a, it's a good, I think it was shot on red. It's shot with this, uh, you know, three-dimensional gimbal system uh, and color graded professionally and there's a soundtrack and all this stuff so it, it, it's kind of it's pretty impressive the type of shots that you can get with a good aerial operator and a good aerial rig um, and speaking of which here is just for fun kind of a, the, the type of stuff that people are using in Hollywood um, and it's a company called Flying Cam 3.0 Sara with the, gy the gyro head um, and the, the cost is approximate because I don't even know that they sell a unit per se it, it's a <laughs> helicopter and it requires a crew uh, and whatnot. And if you're going to get the red Epic M, $50,000, and the lens is $5,000. But this was the type of shot, if you did see Skyfall, where they're tracking motorcycles and then they pull up really high. And it's really just an, it's an unmanned helicopter is, is what it is. We yeah, can get, the footage, uh, was, yeah. I mean, it, footage was amazing. Um, here is uh, here's a, a photo of you kind of, monitoring what you're seeing from the copter there um what's the range of these of uh, of these uh transmission systems uh so like everything else in this hobby the range depends on on what you buy and can can vary dramatically so you know if you build a system that's designed for first person view and uses uh radio control that's very low frequency i mean you know they're designed to work I don't even know what the numbers are, 40 to 50 kilometers away, longer than, than certainly I'm going to even think about flying, um, since I'm mostly interested in, in getting video and stills from the air. So the systems that I use are pretty much out of the box. I mean, I have uh, a, a spectrum radio that I use with the quads that I build. Um, the Phantom will, will go, I think people have tested it around a mile, and uh, really it's battery life that's the issue. You know, yeah. you can, it doesn't matter how much... Con control you have if you can't make it there and back. Um, and so people do these tests where they fly them out as far as possible and then fly them back. Um, most of the new systems coming out have fail-safe built in, so if you lose radio control or you run low on battery, they're designed to come back to home. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll just fly back to you, um, which has saved me a couple times and you know most people I know who fly enough. Um, so there are a bunch of safeguards built in to try to, try to keep, <laughs> you know, keep you in the game. Um, so I, I think, you know, practically they go further than you want to take them. Um, the consideration really is that if you're on some kind of very high frequency control, like 2.4 gigahertz, if you fly around something and there's, you know, you lose line of sight, uh, trees even, you, you, you'll probably lose radio. And yeah. what that means is your, your quadcopter will go into autopilot and try to come back at 20 meters for the, you know, the phantom comes back at 20 meters and if there is a building in the way it's going to crash into it and, <laughs> excuse me you said you're getting about eight to ten minutes off of off of the battery on the on the DJ phantom yeah I mean loaded with a gimbal and a camera um, it's probably eight minutes before I get battery warning um, I tend to come back at six just to to be safe when I'm over water mm -hmm. or over over something um, that might be hard to get to um, this is going to change really quickly not battery technology, but um, I mean, for example, the next version of the Phantom that's coming out has a double capacity battery, more than double capacity, so it flies for more than 20 minutes without a camera or with a camera on it. Um, and so I think we'll we'll see that you know the competition, the bar will have been raised, and everyone else will have to follow. Yeah. Um, so I think you know we'll be seeing kind of 12 to 15 minute flight times with a gimbal uh, just in the next couple months. Um. Yeah, when you're taking stills, uh, are you using the video monitoring, and how are you actually triggering the stills to go off? Um, well, since I have, I'm shooting mostly with GoPro these days. Um, I just put it in time lapse, you know, so I have it set to take one picture every uh, two seconds. Yeah. And uh, 
and that's it. You just let it go. So it works pretty well. Um, one of the reasons the Sony NEX systems are so popular, aside from there being gimbals built specifically for it, is that it's one of the few systems in which you can trigger stills and video separately uh, via remote. You know, so there's some guy, or, you know, people make remote triggers for all sorts of applications, and uh, one of the only cameras uh, where you can do both is the Sony without getting complicated, like plugging in the USB. Right, right. Interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, balancing out the copter and doing as much uh, to, to eliminate vibration and using the gimbal. Are you doing any stabilization in post? And if so, what sort of software are you using? I do some stabilization in post when it's necessary. Um, I basically, if there's if there's no wind, then I don't have to stabilize. Even if there's a little bit of wind, um, and if there's a lot of wind, sometimes what happens since my gimbal is two axis, I get the helicopter moving left, you know, yawing left and right, uh, and that's something that the gimbal does not account for. My gimbal doesn't. Um, so I run uh, Final Cut Pro. Uh, 10 or X, um, and I run Adobe's, you know, CS CS6 production suite. Mm -hmm. I use both. I also use Core Melt's lock and load uh, stabilizer. I I'm, I don't think the any of these stabilization uh, algorithms are actually work that well with this footage because uh, I have to try often. I have to try all three, and then sometimes it'll do weird things. You know, Final Cut will the picture will just spin off the frame. I've seen that happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing. It got confused. Um, lock and load tends to work really well um, and then occasionally doesn't. And then Premiere, of course, if you use, uh, um, what do they call it, warp stabilizer, it only works, it only takes advantage of one CPU. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not parallel processing and so it can take me hours to stabilize a single clip so I tend not to even try to use it right. in, the, in CS6 world. Interesting. Have have you done anything where you're shooting at 2K and that gives you a little more wiggle room to sort of stabilize the shot? I know a lot of people are saying, we're going to shoot in 4K, not because we want the resolution, but so we can actually crop in on the image. Yeah, so I shoot in 2.7K a lot and crop in for stabilization. That works really well. Um, that tends to break down in the Final Cut world because they don't like 2.7K. They say, well, is this 2K or is it 4K? Well, it's right. neither. And so I... You know, I've had a really hard time working in Final Cut with 2.7K. And, and in Premiere, pretty much their warp stabilizers doesn't work for me because I, I'm not stabilizing a, a, a three-second clip. I'm stabilizing, you know, a 20-second, uh, like a 20-second clip, and that takes forever. And so, and I have a Mac, you know, 12-core Mac Pro, and it's just not using any of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then I use Core Melt's lock and load, and if that works, which it usually does, then I'm happy. But practically, I have to try everything. And this is sort of what I do in all video editing on the Mac because I just feel like it's not well supported these days. Yeah. The, um, the, the NEX7, can, can that be uh, carried by the DJI Phantom or do you need to upgrade because of the weight? No, you need to upgrade. Um, that's one of the kind of out-of-the-box uh, supported cameras f from DJI. You know, they sell a S800 hex um, bigger a uh, bigger hexacopter that holds a uh, you know special gimbal that's designed for either the NEX7 mm -hmm. or the Panasonic GH2 or GH3. Um, so very specific cameras. Um, if you buy your own gimbal, you can buy one that holds the NEX um, fairly inexpensively and put it on any hexacopter, and it should lift it. And for the Black Magic, what are you going to use as your copter? So that's the Y6 setup that I'm working on. Oh, so I'm, you know, I'm doing basically I'm still doing research because you know there are only a few of those frames out there, um, and the documentation in the hobby world is terrible. You know, so you often can't even find a pic. You cannot find a picture, a real picture. You see a render, nobody shows you the you know the mechanism for folding, uh, and then when you email them, they might respond maybe from their iPhone with a one sentence thing. You know, so it's not there yet. And I'm just I think it's it will be in a few months and maybe six months. You know there will be a company that takes support seriously uh, who releases a frame, and I think a lot of people are going to buy them. Yeah. Do you have any trouble carrying this rig into foreign countries? Are they thinking, man, this guy's like CIA or something at the <laughs> customs? Well, I've, I've taken it to a few countries and not had any problems, um, mostly because the Phantom looks like a toy. So, you know, when, when asked what it is, and you always get asked because when this thing goes through X-ray at customs, they they want to know what it is. I just, I say toy helicopter. And then, you know, usually 
they think, oh, that's so cool, and they they want to look at it. So they right. all the guys come over and and look at it. Um, I did hear a story about two two people trying to do um, like medical aid drops or something, um, going through Egypt and getting jailed for some number of months with quadcopters. Oh, yeah. um, so I don't I haven't found that you know the actual article or articles about that, but I've heard stories like that. Um, but I haven't heard very many, and I know quite a few people who are traveling, but they're traveling mostly to Europe or you know through North America and occasional trips to um, first world Asia. Um, and I'll be taking it to Indonesia in February, uh, you know, as another experiment, and we'll see what happens there. Now, I know you're not a lawyer, but we're getting a lot of questions regarding the legality, and a lot of people who say, "Hey, I, you know, I, I, I deal with real estate. I'd love to do these aerial real estate shots, etc." What, what sort of guidance would you give people that, that have sort of commercial aspirations for this stuff? Well, we pretty much only have, uh, we have some precedent in that the FAA has shut down at least one real estate person, uh, one publicly, you know, who's written about it um, being shut down uh, from doing, doing these things. And, it, you know, taking a picture of a house for the purposes of real estate sales is definitely commercial. There's just no way to get around that. Um, and even if you get someone to do it, you know, well, I'll fly for free and then I'll do editing. I just don't think that's going to hold up if, if they actually go after you. Yeah. Um, I don't know who goes after you since the FAA is like a, you know, regulatory body. It's not really, you know, I, I guess they can go after you if they want. Um, and then right now there's a really interesting lawsuit going on. Um, there's a guy who has flown a lot of the, you know, uh, he flew like the Grand Canyon and, Statue of Liberty, all sorts of stuff like that, who's in a lawsuit right now. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on what happens there, you know, I think if he gets nailed, then that's going to set precedent for a lot of the stuff that we do. Yeah. Um, and if, if he gets away with it and, you know, forces them to actually come up with clear regulations, uh, then that'll be great because then they'll have to actually come up with the regulations. I think we just, what's really unfortunate right now is it's all sort of unknown and everyone argues about it. No one agrees. You know, nobody who reads everything has a clear picture of what's legal, what's not legal, what's enforceable. You know, enforcement is another issue. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, what's happening is people are just sort of doing things. And, uh, and this is what I'm doing, too, because I don't, you know, I assume what I'm doing is legal. And having the FAA say, yes, what you did was legal in Santa Cruz is a great thing because I... I'm sort of validated there, um, right? But you know, I don't have that judgment for everything I'm doing. <laughs> well, it seems like the past three weeks with the government shutdown would have been a perfect time to fly your drones at will. <laughs> yeah, totally. I joked about that as soon as it happened, and um, you know, I think well, one one thing that a lot of people like to do is or dream about doing is going and flying national parks, and you know, we have some parks that have explicitly said you cannot fly. Um, oh, but really? it's funny because I just I just read correspondence between uh, you know, like Yosemite and and a photographer, and he was like, no, you cannot fly in Yosemite. We may allow flights over 2,000 feet occasionally, but it takes, you know, some number of months for approval. Why don't you try this other park? <laughs> you know, so it wasn't don't fly in national parks. It was don't fly in our national park, but try this other park. Yeah. Are you, you know, uh, uh, we, we started uh, by saying drone is such a loaded word, um, and you said when you go through customs and whatnot, you refer to it as like a toy helicopter What's kind of what's the terminology that we should be using to 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 be most kind of friendly towards the public? I, I'm not sure there is a friendly term. I mean, in every everything public I've done, the the organizers have always stuck the word drone in the title, and I pretty much never use the word drone. You know, I will always say it's a talk on aerial imaging. Um, I'm trying to use UAS, which is unmanned aircraft system. That's the official term that's been adopted. It's a terrible, it's not a public friendly term. UAS, <laughs> you know, UAS is an acronym. Acronyms are, no one knows what it stands for. Right. And you can't pluralize it easily. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Um, it's, you know, is it UAS's? And um, so I will say, I actually don't know. I, I vary. I, I talk about aerial imaging from multi rotors. Multi rotor aircraft is also not a friendly term, um, but it, at least is just confusing and not scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, when I do these these stories, if if we talk about drones, I try to talk about the good things about drones and the responsible operators out there, and um, have successfully managed to get at least one news story out that was 100% positive about drone use. Yeah. Um, but what I don't want is to 
is to, you know, use the word drone to hype it up too much because it just sounds bad. I'm wondering, uh, now speaking from sort of a, a marketing standpoint, obviously you're not the first person to be doing drone photography, drone aerial photography. Right. Um, what, what do you think it was about the video that you created of the surfers that helped it to go viral? Whereas, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that you can find on YouTube and, and, and Vimeo, but for some reason yours kind of caught people's attention. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm definitely not the first person to do this, and I, I would never make that claim. There are lots of people who have paved the way with with incredible amounts of hard work, um, and um, you know I think it may be like and I've, I, this is something that I've tried to to promote in in all of my public uh, you know public talks or um, magazine or articles about using these things um, is that it would be great if people had had projects in mind you know even if they're very small like I'm going to go document this particular thing. And I'm going to spend the whole morning there and collect footage, and then I'm going to edit in, edit it into something. And it doesn't have to take a lot of time. I mean, the Santa Cruz thing was, you know, two hours of shooting. There was some driving and socializing involved, um, and then I, it took an hour to edit. And so it's really like three hours of sitting, of flying and sitting on a computer for something that then you know captures a lot of attention. And so really, it's just like have a project, plan the project rope some friends into it because a lot of my friends are interested in this stuff so it can be a social thing as well yeah um, but you know the way I started was going out to the look to the local park and flying and then uploading the video and, and like nobody wants to see that video I I don't want to see video of someone's backyard or like <laughs> right. some, some park a hundred times I just don't care and the, the only time I care is when I'm I'm doing research for a certain uh, a piece of hardware like a gimbal I want this gimbal. I want to see how it performs in ten different people's setups, and I'll go do the do the research. Yeah, you know. So on the one hand, I'm glad that footage is out there. I tend to put this stuff on YouTube unlisted, so I can send it to people who are who might be interested. Um, and of course, all my early stuff is up, so you can see all the early experiments. They're terrible. <laughs> um, but when you know, when you get to a point where you can fly competently and produce interesting footage, you know, I think it's really just being like having consideration for the project and not just going out and shooting something random. Right, right. So for the people who are listening and they've never done any sort of aerial photography and they've never done uh, dealt with copters and whatnot, if you had to say uh, a budget and an amount of time that you're going to have to invest to get a, quote, usable product, what are we talking about? Okay, so it, this is another, another thing that varies widely, but um, the most important thing is to become a competent pilot. By far, it's the same thing in underwater photography. You have to be a good diver. You have to have absolute control of buoyancy, and the same thing applies here. You know, if you cannot control the aircraft, you're going to get lucky and get a couple shots, but you're also potentially endangering yourself and others. You know, and uh, so I would say practice a lot with a quadcopter, um, and if you need to put a camera on it, get a quadcopter that can hold a housed GoPro. Mm -hmm. um, so you know the Phantom does this. The DJ uh, uh, 3D Robotics new Iris has a GoPro mount. You know a lot of the new um, quadcopters that are coming out, the competitors have GoPro mounts. So you just get a GoPro, put it in the housing, stick it on. That way, if you crash, you're not going to lose your camera probably. Um, but mostly, it's just it's just practicing. So I would recommend um, something like the Phantom. Right now, it would be the Phantom because it's really still the only thing that is has been proven. Um, it's 479, which means it's discounted. You know, very good price now. Mm -hmm. And then just practice flying that around all the time. And and the other thing I recommend is getting a toy that um, you know they weigh like an ounce and they fly the same way. So there's one called the Blade Nano QX, uh, Blade Nano QX, and that I think it's around 100 dollars with a controller. And um, you can fly that around. You can. It's got prop guards. You can crash it into your walls. <laughs> You're probably not going to hurt anybody or anything, including itself. And if you do hurt something, the replacement parts are just a couple dollars. So just, it's really like get as much flight time as possible and um, be considered about how you practice. You know, like don't just go hover and try to get footage, but fly figure eights, you know, fly away from you, back to you very slowly. Mm -hmm. Don't be a cowboy about it. You know, if you can't control it, it's not when you're uh, calm that it's going to affect you. It's when you your heart rate spikes because you're now you're 10 feet from something and you realize that you don't know which way to turn, which way to move. Right. 
Um, so this isn't the sort of thing where yeah. I go out to the local camera store and I rent something for two days on the weekend and all of a sudden I have usable video. I, I don't absolutely, I agree that it's not like that. And um, we get emails, I get emails and my friends get emails all the time from people who say, I have this project, it's on Saturday. <laughs> and I just ordered a phantom. How do I, and I'm like, okay, well, you're you're gonna you're gonna crash, right? And you might crash on set. First of all, you, you know, are you even allowed to use it on set? You know, I don't know. I don't want to get involved in those discussions. But it is absolutely not the sort of thing that you can just pick up and do, unless you have a ton of self control. You know, if you if you have 100% confidence that you can control yourself then you could probably learn to hover the thing, just put the thing in the air, get the footage and bring it down without crashing it. Right. But as soon as you have to try to do some kind of aircraft movement, you know, it's there's no guarantee it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> we we have run out of time. It's been a really interesting and sort of fascinating look at an emerging technology that you know, the price point has really come to the point where it's accessible to a lot of people. Eric is just one of these guys that's really giving to the community. You can check out that video if you didn't see the URL uh, earlier at echangphoto.com. His new website talking about uh, this helicopter, quadcopter, drone copter, aerial imaging and tutorial, skypixel.org. And for those of you who don't want to take to the air but want to get underwater, the 10... Uh, even more than 10 years old now, wetpixel.com is a great, great resource. Um, next week, I want to let you know that we have Jared Bauman, who's the founder of and president of Shoot.edit, talking about uh, pinpointing your trouble points and finding solutions in your workflow. So they are a company that offers uh, post-production services, uh, primarily for wedding photographers. Um, but uh, because of that, they're sort of experts in sort of raw workflow processing, et cetera. Uh, and you can register for that at bit.ly slash shoot dot edit webinar. But I want to thank Eric Chang so much for joining us today. Eric, uh, always great talking to you. All right. Thanks so much for having me and look forward to seeing you. <laughs> uh, we did record this uh, video so you can see it on our blog probably in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, and uh, in case you missed any of the details, uh, uh, you can review that. But I'll also go to uh, Eric's website at skypixel.org. I want to thank you guys for joining us today. Hope to see you at the next webinar. Bye-bye.